was there anyone in that conversation who, in your observation, had had, had too much to drink? Uh, like Mayor Giuliani. The mayor was definitely intoxicated, but I do not um, know that his level of talk, intoxication when he spoke uh, with the president, for example. Spoke to the president several times that night. I remember saying that, I, to the best of my memory, and I was saying that we should not go and declare victory until we had a better sense of the numbers. I didn't mind being characterized as being part of Team Normal. We looked at the video, we interviewed the witnesses, it was not true. I told him that the stuff that his people were shuttling out to the public were bull. Was the president's mind was, was, was made up. Are you out of your effing mind? I said, I, but I only want to hear two words coming out of your mouth from now on. Orderly transition. From a defabricated garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA, this is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, a yearning for a time when we could set aside any family dysfunction wrought by COVID and sing Kumbaya. And now, the podcast host who doesn't need Kumbaya when he's basking in the glow of his garden shed, Pete. Dominic! Thank you, Pico. And let me yield to my friend Ellie Mistal, who said this on MSNBC last night. Yeah, so one of the ways that we know that Trump doesn't actually believe that Giuliani was too drunk to give advice is that Trump has not brought a, a case against Rudolph Giuliani for ineffective assistance of counsel, right? That's what that's what I would do if I was really felt like I was being given terrible legal advice and acting it and to the detriment of the country. By this point, I would have turned it around on Giuliani. Trump hasn't done that because the whole point is that he agreed with what Giuliani was saying. And that's why he did it. It's not because of the legal advice, right? So, like, I can go out tonight, and I can find a drunk guy who thinks that I look like a Chippendales dancer. That doesn't make it so. And if I start stripping, right, that's on me, not on the drunk guy who thinks that I look hot that time, right? So, like, the, the idea that all of this is somehow going to come down to Giuliani's state of intoxication, it does not. It comes down to Trump's state of mind right. listening to drunk lawyers as he's, uh, as he's organizing his coup. And there you have it. There's simply nobody better than Ellie Mistal at laying it out there for you. I thought that was a good way of opening. And sorry for the uh, the bleep on Bill Barr. You really should hear him say bullshit. And everything else he said as the star witness of yesterday, day two of the January 6th committee hearings, which was explosive as Trump's entire inner circle, except for drunk Giuliani, basically threw him under the bus because, of course, they were under oath. Lots of other stories to mention here on Tuesday, the 14th of June, here smack in the middle of June, including U.S. stocks plummeting into bear territory, Russia drawing closer to capturing a very strategic, important eastern city whose name I can't even begin to pronounce, Severon Donetsk. And much, much more. But the top story, of course, yesterday that dominated headlines, cable news chatter and the attention of most Americans and international news watchers was the January 6th committee hearing. And I think of all the millions of different kinds of programs out there talking about what happened yesterday, analyzing it, helping you understand nobody does a better job than we did here on Stand Up Today with comedians Jay Black and Noel Kasler because the type of conversation that you're about to hear, I don't think it took place many other places. Noel Kasler knows all the Trumps. He worked with not only the Trumps, but so many other celebrities throughout his entire career. And does he spill the tea on his own podcast and his own social media? And of course, here on Stand Up a couple times before, bringing Jay Black in was a great idea. Thank you to Rob Dog out in California, who is a longtime listener and subscriber for suggesting this idea because, man, Rob, I just don't know how it could have gone any better than it did. I have a lot to say. I want to read some things and give you some different takes, but sometimes you have a conversation so good that you just want to get to it because, you know, there's not much you can do to top it. And that's exactly what this conversation is. I've known comedian Jay Black 
black for a long time, and he used to be an English teacher. He quit like 10 years ago to embark uh, on a career as a stand-up comic, and he has done a- an incredible job. He's had a tremendous amount of success, headlining clubs around the country, touring extensively in Europe, performing at thousands of colleges across the country. He was College Performer of the Year, College Comedian of the Year, three times. But for the last 10 years, he's also done weekly radio spots and discussed TV, pop culture, sports. And in 2009, he started writing screenplays, produced a string of successful projects with some pretty big stars in them. Also began acting in his projects, but it's his Twitter feed that I love the most. I think Jay is a hilarious comedian, but I should say it's him I love the most. Jay has become a good friend of my, to me over the years. He's only been on the show, I think, once before, but he really should be on a lot more. He's funny, he's honest, he's vulnerable, and he's really smart. And it was great to have him joining Noel Kasler. It really made for quite a trio. And what can I say about Noel? He's a stand-up comedian, podcast host, political commentator, best known for his outspoken commentary on Twitter, his weekly car rants, his 25 years of experience behind the scenes in live television and music industry, including six seasons working directly with the Trump family on Celebrity Apprentice. And he has used the last four years and social media to spill it all. And he is a moral and righteous and honest and vulnerable and thoughtful guy who I've really grown to love and respect. And now we're thinking we might do this more because of how well it went. So I hope that you like it. Follow Jay on Twitter at jblackisfunny and Noel at Hassler Noel and links in the show notes. You can thank me later for those follows if you aren't already following them. And we might even do a stand-up show together. It, it went so well. Something really interesting happened when we started talking about the, the Trump's drug addiction. Noel started talking about it. I found out that both of my guests are sober and in recovery. And you're going to want to stay for the end because I asked them both to talk a little bit more about that, having learned it during the conversation. And both these guys were poignant and funny and thoughtful and I think helpful as well. And that's what I want to try to accomplish on the show each and every day. So not only is it a really interesting conversation about the January 6th committee hearings day two, given Noel's experience, perspective, Jay's thoughtfulness and humor, it's also, I think, a conversation that's going to make you feel better. So I hope you like it. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again, Rob Dog. Send your suggestions to me, standupwithpete at gmail.com. Who would you like to hear with other folks? I'm trying to match more people up. Here's Noel Kasler and Jay Black right now. Yeah, this, I can tell you right now, is going to be a really good thing that we do. And I think maybe we'll, we might have to do this live in the next hearing during the breaks when all the stupid people come on and say, I can't believe uh, Trump sold a lie. We'll be like, what? So I'm very excited. I've just told you all about Jay and Noel. And thanks again to Rob Dog, longtime listener who, uh, who suggested, because he follows both these guys on Twitter. They're both brilliant and hilarious. He said, you know what I'd like? Three white guys uh, on my pod. (laughs) Um, So thank you, Rob. And thank you, Jay and Noel, for joining me. I'm super excited to talk about the hearings and whatever else we get to. 100%. Great to be here. Thank you, Pete. And Noel, we talked earlier. So excited to be here. This is like Twitter royalty sitting with us, Pete. This is very awesome. Yes. You're too kind, Jay. I'm a big fan. I'm honored to be here with you and Pete. Couple of real serious, smart comedians. I hope (laughs) to learn something today. And good, good shout out to Rob Dog. Thanks, Rob Dog. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Rob. Thank you. Uh, so uh, he's he's going to absolutely love that. That's going to get him through the next 48 hours, by the way. He's going to share. <laughs> he's just going to clip that out and share it. So you, we, you both watched today's hearings. You know, I actually was just like when he suggested, it's like, it'd be great to have a conversation with both these guys. They pay really close attention to current events. They tweet really funny things and thoughtful things about it as well. And it'll be great to just talk to them. But then I realized, well, they're both watching these hearings. We're all watching them. I actually thought they were tomorrow. And so we can basically talk about your reactions to them, which I think is going to be, frankly, better and certainly more entertaining analysis than anything we saw on the cable news network. So, guys, let's get to it by starting with uh, going to Noel to talk about his actual relationship with so many of the people whose names we're hearing, specifically Rudy Giuliani, who, Jay, you you had some thoughts about Giuliani. And but but first, we we, you both did. I got to hear. No. How do you know this? How do you know? America's mayor. 
Well, I'm a New Yorker, and I used to live at 180 East End across the street from Gracie Mansion ju- during all the 9-11 years. And my mm-hmm. uncle was an editor at New York Magazine, a political writer who covered Giuliani when he was mayor and then went to Time Magazine and actually had to write the cover story, the America's mayor cover story. Wow. So it's personal. And the first time I met Giuliani, I was doing the Goodwill games with him in the 90s. We were shooting them down the old like uh, wintergreen there there was a thing outside of the old twin towers you know and we had like you know pataki there and and all you know ted turner and all these guys and giuliani wouldn't get out of his makeup chair because he didn't like a joke we had written to (laughs) for him to say right and he crumpled up the piece of paper threw it in my face and cursed me out and said i'm not getting out of this freaking chair until you change this joke and you know i'm like a little pa on a headset you know i'm probably like late 20s at this point like uh mr giuliani will not get out of his chair and he's just (laughs) cursing me out and uh, the joke was, welcome to New York. It's a great city. Just don't jaywalk. Right. <laughs> completely, completely yeah, sure. mild, you know, and, innocent. Right. And he threw a complete tantrum. So that's who he is. And I'll shut up now. But I tell people this. Trump is more odious. I mean, Giuliani, rather, is more odious a person than Donald Trump. How and Donald you, Trump wears a diaper. How, you know, <laughs> <laughs> how could you say that? How could he say that? What do you think about Giuliani? Jay? He's saying he's, he's worse than well, Trump as a person, which I he knows both these guys, but I'm going to argue hard that that can't possibly be the case, Jay. Well, I, if I if I could just speak for Noel for a second, just based on that story, that it's it's not so much that he's the more odious human being, but he kept two faces up a lot longer than Trump was able to. Trump has you know sponge cake brain, so it's very difficult for him to not be him. You know, even when he tries to be for a little bit, like I'm going to be a statesman, it lasts for like eight seconds before he starts naming names of his enemies. Uh, But Giuliani, I I was, uh, you know, hoodwinked by him. I spent, you know, all of the early 2000s going that guy got us through without him. Like in my brain, it was almost like he was up on the Twin Towers trying to swat the plane away. Like (laughs) that's how much I connected him to the aftermath of 9-11 and like how he saved everything. And the, the slow unwinding of of him, you know, the, the slow gin soaked unwinding of Gi- Rudy Giuliani has been like devastating for me. But from what I'm getting from what you're saying is he was always this yes. guy. Yeah. He was just able to contain it like, you know, like the Ghostbusters containment unit, uh, you know, for a long time until the booze and the age got to him. That's how Correct. I felt. That's how I felt uh, about Mark Gastineau, how you feel about Giuliani. <laughs> Similar fall from from grace. Uh, But also you both commented uh, on Twitter about the references to to Giuliani's inebriation. By the way, it would have been so funny for Zoe Lofgren, I think her name is Congresswoman. You know, they're really obviously trying not to be political here. But it would have been funny if while she was, you know, reading the objective report, she just said as an aside, Rudy Giuliani, who had possibly the longest fall from grace of any American in history, said blind plan, but obviously she wasn't going to do that. But Jay, uh, no, what about his drinking? What's the deal? He's a drunk. He hangs out in the Grand Havana Lounge every night, which is the private club on top of Jared Kushner's triple six Fifth Avenue, literally, and holds court and gets drunk. And he's been a drunk for a long time. And I'm not faulting anybody for that. As some of you guys know, you know, I'm in recovery myself a long time. There's no shame in dealing with an issue having people that are still in active addiction and alcoholism make decisions on behalf of the country is incredibly dangerous i point it out in a comedic way but it's terrifying because anybody who's in active addiction knows you're thinking about yourself and your right. own self-centered fears and desires and resentments and what we saw was a white house house seething with that sort of thing, you know, with actual open drunken drunkenness, right. you know, they testified today. He was the only one who got the president's ear, a drunk guy, you know, right. at two in the morning. It was like snort some more Adderall and go out there and tell him you won. And we can drift <laughs> for this off of the next few months. And they did. They made a quarter of a billion dollars in the coming months. Yeah, uh, it's the most profitable venture Trump has ever been a part of. Bingo. Uh, hey, if I could just just take a minute here. To, to shout out, because I'm sure she's listening, uh, Liz Cheney, uh, the comedic timing. First off, she's been blowing me away this whole time. Yeah. I know that as a progressive, her her opinions of how the, the country should be run are odious. 
the the thing that I like about Liz Cheney is that I both we both agree that there should be an America with a democracy. Right. So I can put aside <laughs> whatever feelings I have about her to sort of you know uh, extend a, a branch across the yeah. other side. But the comedic timing that she had on the and a apparently uh, uh, inebriated Rudy Giuliani was just chef's kiss. It was just wonderful. Yeah, nice she just done. She just said apparently inebriated. And I thought it's interesting you point out that moment. I, I guess I thought to myself, that seems a little cheap way to say what you should say in such a hearing, which is uh, intoxicated on, on alcohol or something more specific. Right. But inebriated might be the most accepted and impactful word to describe the type of drunk know that he was and and you wrote rudy has been a drunk for decades glad it's finally being called out and i'm glad that you mentioned you're in recovery i don't think i knew that and i hope it doesn't bother you that i'm drinking whiskey here at 2 30 in the afternoon i don't have a problem <laughs> i have no problem but but i mean it's also important just to defend your point which is yes we all know people or are people who are in recovery or are addicts but that we all generally, I hope, agree, especially those who are in recovery, that that person should not have the president's ear and too often in America in history probably has. Uh, right. But but I mean, how bad is it and how, uh, his drinking and how bad was it that he was apparently the final guy getting to talk to Trump sometimes and he's going to listen to him? Why is he listening to him, though? Right. Well, because Trump's an addict, too. You know, they're buddies. They're buddies. And we don't need to go into all that. You make some excellent points. You know, I'd like to say, imagine how drunk you have to be for that statement to get in the congressional record. You know, drinking is <laughs> acceptable. I was the in-house bike messenger for the Congressional Budget Office when I was 18. I would deliver packages all over Capitol this Hill. This guy is fucking Forrest Gump, Jay. I, I did a lot of weird shit, but I was a bike courier in D.C. And they would set up bars outside of representatives offices on Friday. Like you would have happy hour. Booze is part of how business gets done in D.C. Old school D.C. was a three martini lunch. This stuff isn't looked down on. This is not a town of teetotalers. So imagine how drunk you would have have to been for the right. hearsay to make its way back up to the hill and to come out in such a, a forceful statement. And I agree with Jay, just brilliant comedic timing and i don't think enough praise can be heaped on liz cheney i yeah. too am a progressive and you know i don't agree with her politically but she harkens back to what politics used to be a right. true conservative two different sides compromising but knowing that the greater good and the rule of law is the bottom line not somebody's ego and ability to grift uh, you give her more credit than i will but i don't i'm not far off the point is she voted with trump 92 percent of the time right. but she drew the line at the big lie that's the way i say right. it uh, jay tweeted at J Black is funny, by the way, is his Twitter handle in case you didn't know and you're not following. He, Thank you. you. You wrote, I like that they stay on Rudy long enough to watch him look up, trying to remember his memories floating in a pool of middle shelf vodka. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. It's, uh, what is he? Uh, I, they, they, they did do that. They cut to him a couple of times and you could see like, you know, they always say which direction your eyes look when you're trying to come up with a memory and when you're trying to come up with a lie. And I think his just rolled straight up back into his head <laughs> as his brain. Like, I imagine it looks like, uh, you know, like you're looking through it through a pond or something, just waves and 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 shapes. But, yeah, I mean, to, to just further the point that <laughs> Noel made about, like, what you need to do. You're in a room with Jason Miller, right. uh, uh, Stephen uh, uh, Miller, right? right? Uh, and and, you know, the collection of Adam's family characters that is the Trump inner circle and you stand out right as the bad one where everyone's going like i don't know you know i don't know you know stephen miller is draining the blood of a rat for sustenance and looks over and there's rudy giuliani and you're going oh yeah that guy's messed up i don't know right. if he should be right. here boys He's right. a little out there you know it's a miller you make him a smoothie Right. Don Jr. is in the room. Larry Kudlow is in there. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's like David Crosby giving you an intervention. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah. we're doing well. This is going to be a thing. I think this is going to be a thing. I'm feeling good. You guys are your audition tape is really I know that Let's make uh, it happen. this is a Can huge I... bre break for both of you uh, being on my shed <laughs> podcast. So but no, the, here's the thing. That really piss. I, this is to me one of the most important points uh, from today is kind of the it, not about the hearing. I think the hearing actually was so well done today. I was a little critical yeah. of night one only because I think Benny Thompson is a snooze, and why have him there when there's 15 100%. other people or better performers? Um, but but 
Today I thought it was so well done. My only criticism is why was it at 10 a.m.? Why, why did we leave primetime? But putting that aside, this is where you guys, I really want to hear your analysis because this is what was missed. And I even texted, I won't say who, but I know most of these cable news pundits. And, you know, from time to time, it, I, don't, I rarely do it. But if no one's going to make the most obvious point for an hour and I'm screaming, I got to make it. So I texted a friend of mine who was on CNN and I said, listen. You're all sitting there acting, and so is Adam Kinzinger and other people on the panel, as if you're surprised that Trump grifted uh, the, the, the American people, that you're surprised that he told a lie, thus leading to the insurrection. When any New York reporter, anybody who'd ever written about Trump, and certainly our Noel Kasler, knows this, and all these apparently psychiatrists who wrote a book by Bandy Lee and others, this man will say no to anybody who doesn't tell him what he wants to hear, fire them, until finally one of those clowns walks in with their makeup and says, Sir, the Jewish space laser attacked the Dominion machine. And he's like, thank you. No, like that point, the acting like we didn't know this is who he's always been. Well said. I agree with you. I mean, the obvious has never been pointed out with Trump. They never point out that the emperor is wearing no clothes. We all knew on January 6th what it was about and who caused it. He'd been tweeting it for weeks, months beforehand. Come to D.C. There, there You know, Trump, I, I'll make this analogy. It, a lot of the American media and political system was based on an honor system, right? We didn't really have yeah. like fail safes because we thought nobody would really egregiously go beyond the line. It was like in the country when you see an apple stand and it's like, here, leave five bucks and take a quart of apples or something. Trump came yeah. by, took the money jar, burned down the apple stand <laughs> and took all the apples and kept going. And everyone's like, is this normal? You know, yeah. he, like he, yeah. he wears you down. A lot of my stand up started because I wanted to tell the stories of what was happening behind the scenes. And the first season we did the Miss Teen USA contest. He inspected the contestants. I've told Pete this before on his show. Yeah. He, con he, he inspected them and it cost an hour of union time. We had DGA union, all this stuff. It cost a fortune. Everybody was outraged. What happened the next year? They wrote it into the schedule. Non crew call. What does Trump the inspection entail again? He'd stick his fingers in their mouth and check their teeth and stuff. He was looking for like like they were horses. I mean, it was wow. it it was gnarly. But my point is, Trump normalizes you know bad behavior. It's almost like to bring it back to the addiction analogy. It's almost like addiction is a family disease, right? Al Anon right. exists for a reason. You get sick around these lies and almost covering up how bad it is. I think a big part of our national consciousness mm. and media got sucked into that. Like, hey, it's still the president. We got to treat him with respect. Why? He's not treating us with respect. He yes. didn't show up at Biden's inauguration. You know, he burnt the place down and left town. So well said. I'll Although, Jay, I will, you know, Jay has defended those inspections of those young women in the past, and I'm not sure why, 100%. Jay. Yeah, no, not... I, I've been on several podcasts, my pro uh, teen inspection platform. It's, <laughs> I, it's, it's hurt me, Pete. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. I, I think it was a mistake. I don't know what you're thinking. Uh, let me just make two points. If it, it, I was raised by uh, my mom as a narcissist, and one of the things that I, well, she was, she she's dead now. I, I had nothing to do with it. Um, <laughs> the The thing that you notice uh, about them is that you tend to interpret other people's actions through your own lens. So you go like, well, I wouldn't do that unless I had a good reason to do that. So they're probably, they're probably doing the same thing. They're not lying about this because I wouldn't lie about this. And I feel like that's what Trump has preyed on for the last, you know, yes. 50 years is that he will interact with people and you give him the benefit of the doubt because human beings give other human beings the benefit of the doubt. And once he stakes out, like as you said, he normalized it, he stakes out that place. And that's just the way it's done now. And it's just the only thing you need for that is, you know, narcissism and no shame. Uh, but I, I want to push back just a little bit, Pete, on the idea that uh, I, I agree with you 100 percent that the news media is covering this poorly. And by the way, I watched it on the YouTube feed from The Washington Post, which uh, if you've ever seen a group of people that don't know how to broadcast trying to do a broadcast, that's a show all in of itself where they're getting cues, but they don't know how to get cues in their ears. They're like, hold on, <laughs> wait, I'm we're a newspaper. We're a newspaper. <laughs> uh, uh, why did that happen? But I love the clinical nature of how the, the hearings are being run. 
You know, they're they're not making it emotional. They're not they're not shocked or outraged. Yeah. It's especially when Liz Cheney's talking. It is just a, a, a someone who has every single receipt and they're just laying it out there in a very controlled manner. Like, here's the evidence, guys. It's all here. I'd love for the media to jump in and go, we know. But uh, so far as convincing the country that there needs to be an indictment, this is the best way to go about it. Uh, let's go back to two of Noel's tweets. I forgot this one about Giuliani, which is important. Who among us is not going to shit face, gone shit faced in the White House and asked a president to ignore the results of a Democratic election? So you fleece a bunch of rubes for another couple of months. Uh, yeah. And he copied Rudy Giuliani on that. But to move it along, uh, we have to talk about Bill Barr. Uh, oh. Because you wrote, this is, again, like, it, it's it's funny as both these guys are, they're also really great analysts of, of, of politics. And I think, as comedians often are, human behavior, and Noel nails it with this, Jay, I think, uh, Bill Barr is probably the most arrogant son of a bitch to ever serve as attorney general. And you could just see how he thinks he's cute, testifying about all the bullshit Trump was spilling, yet he praised him in his resignation letter and failed to warn yeah. the country what was coming. A traitor's traitor. And then he, Noel, uh, thoughtfully copied at GOP on that one. Noel, tell me more about your thoughts on Bill Barr. Well, I mean, I, I've had a problem with Bill Barr for a long time. You know, people forget, but he was the guy who got Elliot Abrams and these guys off from the Iran-Contra affair, where they literally slaughtered villages. El Mazote was a village that was slaughtered in, in El Salvador. You know, all the people were slaughtered. Bill Barr got those guys off. Bill Barr is a cover up man. He's an inside dude. And he's a rich punk who went to Horace Mann and Columbia and would beat up hippies. You know, I went to the, the Hackley School proms where his dad was a headmaster. They called him Chester the Molester. We all know his father hired Jeffrey Epstein, you know, to teach at uh, Chape or spent no, uh, at uh, one, of, some, one of the other Upper East Side schools. Yep. It, the name Dalton to teach right. Dalton. You know, he had a dog in this fight when when Epstein got arrested. Bill Barr first said he would recuse himself because he had worked at the law firm that recently represented Epstein. And then he said, no, I'm actually in charge and all the information needs to go through me. Right. So Barr is a guy who knows how to cover his ass. And this is a long winded way of saying when he sent that resignation letter and he left that day in January, right before Christmas, all I could think was. How hinky is the plan that he's now heard about that Trump and these guys are about to launch that the guy who had no problem with literally massacring women and children in Central America was like, this is a bridge too far. I'm out of here. <laughs> right. I'm out of here, guys. I can't deal with this. Even me, you know, Darth Vader, you know, so. And, and you could see the smugness. He, he was holding court in there. He was yeah. adjusting his papers. He wasn't nervous. He knew that he was the powerful man in there. It reminded me of his confirmation hearing where he's like, well, that depends on how you define what is is or yeah. whatever. You right. know, right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. It, it, yeah. I was going to say, the only time I ever saw him be flustered for a moment, it wasn't on 60 Minutes. It wasn't on any major you know, journalist grilling him. It was when Kamala Harris asked him if the president ever had asked him to, uh, what was it, the question. Right. But but he was flustered for that one moment. But mostly he's the most confident guy in the room. And I, I mean, anything else about, about him where you finished? Sorry, no. Well, it was no, it was open an investigation. I believe right. Kamala yeah. said, have you, has the president ever asked you to open an investigation into somebody? And well, what's, how do you define open? <laughs> you know, how right. do you define right. ask? Which means he did it every day, probably. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But, uh, it's, it's just, it's contemptible. Okay. Cause because Bill Barr could have prevented all of this if anybody in that inner echelon could have walked away and said, this is going too far. Something's up here. Don't believe the big lie. Don't come to D.C. As the principal law enforcement of this country officer, I, I implore Americans to stay home on January 6th. Don't endanger the lives of these brave men and women that protect our democracy. And he did the opposite. You know, so as far as I'm concerned, you know, there's cops blood on his hands and he's the ag so or was. well uh, it sounds like you don't like him but <laughs> but jay what, jay your thoughts on man who looks most like a real life fred flintstone and the former disgraced attorney general bill barr and his performance and anything that you disagree with about the, the uh, character assassination just laid out by our <laughs> new friend so no i, I I'm and where are you on slaughtering you. innocent people in central america i i've heard you defend that as well it's pretty gross yeah it's, i gotta be honest with you a lot of my defenses pete have backfired on me i don't know why i keep making these stands i don't know why i'm pro all these things uh 
No, but it, in all honesty, I, I agree 100. percent I, I think there was a, I had a reply to angry staffer on Twitter um, where he was talking about this is the Bill Barr redemption tour, and I, I honestly don't know would I trade Bill Barr's redemption for Donald Trump finally seeing some sort of justice. And I think I would. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. If it means that we all have to pretend that Bill Barr is a good guy for the next 10 years, if there's just one little iota of justice that, you know, Trump spends two years in a, a minimum security prison, just something where he gets to see a consequence. Because all of those negative traits that Noel mentioned were effective in his testimony. You know, the mm-hmm. fact that he was speaking from on high, where his opinions were just like you know, fact that, you know, calling it bullshit, saying, you know, like laughing the, the laugh that he gave to Dinesh D'Souza's 2000 mules was the best review that anyone could have ever yes. given for that. Just uh, I was waiting for 2000 mules and then the left. All of those negative traits uh, go a long way to being convincing yeah. that he, he that Trump did was knew what he was doing and was wrong in doing it. And you that's wrote, what yep. we need from this. You wrote on yes. Twitter about that. The hearty laugh following Barr's mentioning of 2000 mules is all the review. Anyone needs of that poorly baked pound cake of bad ideas. Jay, well done. Well said. Yeah, it's, you know what? I, I don't want to brag, no, but I have a state uh, state college for degree in English. And I think it could be seen in that metaphor. I'm yeah. very proud of uh, yeah, no. New G- college in New Jersey. Shout out. Thank you for all the help you've given. That's me. impressive stuff for sure. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, let's, let's ask Noel about his relationship with Ivanka Trump. And then Jay, if you could just uh, gear up for all of the jokes you have about her, that'd be great. And I'm, I know okay. Noel has plenty as well. Uh, how do you know? Uh, what do you call her again? <laughs> Vonky. Vonky is my nickname for her. Yeah. yeah. And I was her handler, as you know, Pete. I, I did six seasons of Celebrity Apprentice finales, and the final three I got switched to her because my job in live TV as a talent handler was basically to take care of the divas. You know, I was the guy you was. I did the Tony Awards for twenty years that were on last night. Like I would take care of the host. You know, I'd do Michael Jackson at the VMAs, Madonna, whoever was going to ask for the most stuff is who I would end up getting assigned to, and that became Ivanka. When she pushed out the other people, I forget his name, but the guy you worked with, Pete, who got pushed out, Bill or whatever. There was the older guy that everybody loved on oh, The Apprentice. And oh, then his right hand man in, in, in real life right. uh, who I attacked right. on, on, on television uh, I know. when I asked, <laughs> uh, yeah, what was his name? George, 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 yeah. the, old, the old man, the old man, George. I was on The Apprentice in case you both didn't know uh, the the whole thing was the. They do a fundraiser and they did a comedy show and me and a couple of other comedians who you guys know, Jim Florentine, Carrie Louise Mm -hmm. and uh, and George was in the audience. And I said, I was just doing crowd work. I was like, George is here now. I know George's a veteran. And I said, but I I what I don't know is if it's Confederate or Union. (laughs) It's very old. (laughs) And so then they cut on The Apprentice. The edit was cutting to whatever. And like, oh, my God, Pete Dominic's attacking George's right hand man. This is not going to be good for us. But George laughed. And then a year later, I saw George and his wife at a country club gig I was doing. And they were so happy to see me. Anyway, Noel, sorry, but that's a great story I had to share. I had to get it in there, man. I love that story. I crack up all the time. But anyway, so she was the diva. You know, she asserted herself as like the, you know, the person to watch. And she was basically running the show behind the scenes besides Mark Burnett. So I hated this assignment because everybody else would get a crew call for like four o'clock because the rest of the cast was like meatloaf and Tom Green. It wasn't like heavy lifting. You know, it was like a little pipe and drape, a case of water. We'll be good. They'd be like, no, you got Ivanka. You got to show up at noon to meet her trailer and her glam squad. So we shot the last three seasons at the Museum of Natural History in the parking garage underneath. Right. And she had this gigantic trailer. I mean, you would have thought Will Smith was coming or something. It was like (laughs) she had a sweatshop in the back. It was like ridiculous. (laughs) (laughs) And she had a five person glam squad, five people. And she would sit there for like four hours in hair and makeup. And she has to breathe through a straw because she can't breathe through her nose anymore because she's had so many nose surgeries and stuff that it doesn't really work. So I saw her at one point breathing through a straw as they were doing like, you know, makeup around her and stuff like really crazy stuff. And, uh, 
you know, so that's why I don't like her. <laughs> Not, you know, from a personal standpoint, because well, it was like, you're going to speak for 30 seconds. You're literally going to go right. there, stand next to your dad and be like, excellent pop up shop, Omarosa. And then that's it. <laughs> you know? And I'm here at noon in a parking garage, you know. So so what do you think of her testimony thus far? I mean, on night one, uh, she threw her dad on, under the bus. Yeah. And then and then on this testimony, apparently she was replaced with an animatronic Ivanka. But nonetheless, what did it say? I forget. Yeah, it was like Avatar or something, you know, <laughs> she she's basically like, I, you know, I'm not involved. I'm above it all. I didn't see any of it. And, and that's their game plan. You know, they're really calling the shots. There's nothing that happened in that White House. I guarantee you that Jared and Ivanka didn't have a hand. Right, in. Right. When, when I worked with Trump, he wanted music to play when he walked in a room. He wanted to get high and he wanted to hit on women. Jared and Ivanka wanted to run the world. They had a long game. I mean, it wasn't apparent then that he was running for president, but it was an apparent then that they were looking at the opportunities, you know, and how to commodify them, you know, how to monetize every single situation. And I'll shut up here in a minute, but she was her dad's handler. You know, like I was Ivanka's handler. She was the one who they would bring in to get her to get her dad to do something. One point he didn't get out of his SUV because we didn't have a golf cart for him. And he was freaking out. And we're like, the entrance is 30 feet away. Like, all you got to do is get out and walk into the museum. He's like, I need a golf cart. You know, it's like it's a museum. You can't run a golf cart through the halls of the Museum of Natural History. (laughs) Right. So we'd have to get her to go and assuage him. And and that phony, breathy voice, that sibilant S kind of stuff she does, that's a complete put on. That's to appeal to her father. Her real voice sounds, as I've told you before, Pete, she sounds like me. She sounds like a, you know, a trucker from Queens or something. She curses and she's got, there's an old clip of her on Conan. You can look it up, your listeners, and you hear her original voice. Maybe I'll grab that. Uh, uh, Amazing. Um, Jay, what is the best job someone in your family got you? The most astounding thing, it should always be mentioned, that the president of the United States appointed his daughter and others, her daughter's husband, to the most important positions handling the most important issues. And that kind of nepotism wouldn't fly in any mayor's office in America. It would not fly. The last time it happened was RFK, I think, and it was bad then. Jay, have you uh, received any benefits due to nepotism? And what do you think of Ivanka Trump? Well, I I did get to uh, mow the lawn at my house. Uh, My Mm -hmm. dad uh, gave me that job. I did. I didn't have to earn it. Mm -hmm. He just gave it to me when I was 12 and uh, I mowed lawns for uh, for six years. It was pretty, pretty heady stuff. Well, you put a Uh, landscape out of business, apparently. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, uh, I just I real fast. If I could just ask Noel a question, uh, yeah. was, was she with Jared at that point? When, when I no yeah, continue. I, 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 so was it a steamy, passionate relationship? Was it like they couldn't keep their hands <laughs> off of one another? Like when they walked into the room, it was like a sex bomb went off. Like there was like crackling energy between the two of them. Is am I am I guessing right about this? It was palpable, Jay. I would need to smoke a cigarette. The two of them together would feel like an orgasm by osmosis, just being near them. <laughs> the the heat between those two people. No, when I first started working with them, they were dating. Then they broke up. They were oh, broken really? up. And then they came back and they were engaged. And what happened in the interim was Wendy Dang Murdoch, the ex-girlfriend of Putin and the ex-wife of Rupert Murdoch, after during their breakup, took Ivanka sailing off the coast of Turkey, I believe, but over in Europe, somewhere in the Mediterranean and said, you need to get back together. That's your guy. So when I came back the next season, they were all of a sudden engaged because it's an arrangement, uh, an arranged marriage. Right. It was it was a power couple brokering these two imminently corrupt families. Charles Kushner is just as corrupt as Donald Trump. He just does it on the DL, but he's a complete scumbag. They have the same business model. They're basically slum lords. I don't like that term, but they own lots of low income apartments up and down the East Coast and they harass their tenants and rip them off. Same thing Trump has always done. So they were they were an arranged marriage, basically. And and I don't think Jared is, uh, you know, I'm probably more his type than than Ivanka is, if you know what I'm saying. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we certainly weren't you know, homophobic on that show. Our nickname for him was Kunanan, if that gives oh, you wow. any idea. Right. And it wasn't, and yeah. I don't say this often because I don't want it to disparage, you know, the LGBTQ community yeah. or even sound like a joke. And yeah. half the people in the crew were, were gay and stuff. My mom's a lesbian. Like, it wasn't said 
out of like homophobia. It was said he he reminds us yeah. of a gay serial killer. Like that's the vibe oh, you got. From got him. Now, Jay, you hate gay people specifically <laughs> lesbian. Okay, so um, no, I mean, you don't have to do that one. You don't have to do that one. I'm just waiting for one of my trolls to take these statements and string them together. It's like Pete Dominic reveals the real Jay Black and just posts it underneath everything that I uh, tweet. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm curious about what Putin's ex girlfriend would see as a red flag in somebody, like when you're getting <laughs> advice from her. Right. You know, like how many people has he murdered on your behalf? Well, I would have to say none. Like I don't know if he's right for you. You know, if a man loves you, he'll, he'll kill your enemies for you. That's what <laughs> that's the basis of a good relationship. <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting because I th- their relationship fascinates me. And, you know, your analysis of day one knows 100 percent correct uh, where she threw him under the bus. And it seems like it, it, there's a lot of people and I would put bar into this category as well uh, of people that were just trying to wait out. Right. You know, from the election to January 6th, oh, well, January 20th, but January 6th got in the way that like just none of them wanted to speak up because they were just it was like the end of the, the plane ride and the baby will have to fall asleep eventually. And that's what they were hoping would happen. And it, it didn't. And now they're facing the consequences of their inaction and trying to all say, well, you know, what was I going to do? You know, it's like, right. well, you were the president's daughter. I'm pretty sure if you had spoken up on TV at some point, like, hey, my dad is senile and, you know, addicted. Was it Adderall? No, Adderall. Yeah, he starts Adderall. That was my addiction okay. uh, for I'm sober as well. Uh, I did a lot of Adderall and booze. And every time I saw him, you know, I, I said it a couple of times. Uh, he he has all of the trademarks. And if anybody has ever done that drug the wrong way. Right. That it's all there that the mouth, you know, the, the dry mouth, the, the eyes, the inability to break off from a thought is, is all Adderall. So it's, it's nice to get confirmation. I had no idea that I was getting together. You two quitters. How do I get Adderall is my question. (laughs) Well, you you go to a, a, a psychiatrist in your network and go, I think I have ADHD. And he goes, do you want 30 milligrams of Adderall IR? And you go, that sounds fine. And then uh, three years later, you uh, sleep two hours a night like Don Jr. Yeah. OK. And, and, yeah, go ahead. No. no, I'm saying I'm very active in recovery with a lot of young people. Adderall has replaced cocaine in terms of uh, yeah. an abuse. And it's just like every person under 35 is like, well, college Adderall and, and booze, you know, it's a better and, high. It's a yeah. better high. If you're if you're it's comparing probably the two, in, 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 maybe I have no idea. I'm talking on my ass. But in a short term, it's like you can actually overdose more easily on cocaine so it's more dangerous. Maybe it's more fatal, right. but you can get just as addicted to and really fucked up on life ruining, fucked up on, especially at that age, on Adderall and 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 the mm-hmm. other ADHD drugs as well that I'm sure are similar molecules. No, uh, do you have any insight on Don Jr. Because I don't sense Adderall from him. I yeah, do no. sense cocaine from it, him. Just and, straight cocaine. And when yeah, I worked with him. They were dry. You know this. You're in the program. So Don Jr. was dry. Ivanka was dry. Don Jr. relapsed a couple. Somebody else in the administration was was dry slash sober. I won't mention his name because that's not cool. But obviously relapsed a certain economic advisor who would go on the Sunday morning shows and slur his words was sober for a while before. But my friend Tom Arnold helped Eric Trump try to go to rehab, took him out to Hawaii and tried to get him sober. So they were dry. If you guys remember, Eric Trump got his ass kicked at the Comedy Cellar in 2003. He got really yeah. drunk. Yeah, he picked a fight with a table next to him. And two guy, a guy from Staten Island in the Bronx, or Brooklyn, kicked his ass because he was laughing at a racist kind of like there was a, you know, a racist inference that some comedian had. And, and like, no. Yeah, I know. Imagine. Right. And that, so, and that comedian, Pete Dominic. Right. If people don't know that. Listen, Bingo, he got you back. Call back. <laughs> no, but he got he got really like boisterous and spilled his beer on some dude's girlfriend and they took him outside. That's and what, but his by ass. the way, by the way, I'm not racist. I made that joke knowing Eric Trump would laugh and get his ass kicked. Uh, give me some credit here, point. please. Yeah, exactly. it was a good plot. But I know that explains Eric's face. He got it bashed in and it just stayed that way. Right. <laughs> but uh, it's actually Don Jr. It's on the yeah. New York Post. Like, and, and, and Trump called Noam's father and made him apologize and stuff. Anyway, old news. But uh, Noam is the uh, is the, the owner is of the, the owner company. of the yeah, county yeah. seller. Formerly, his dad owned it. Many. Right. But but is it true that Trump snorts cocaine off an extinct animal's tusk? 
Yes, hundred <laughs> percent. And, you know, and Trump Senior used to do coke too. He was doing Come lines on. in the back of a limo at a VH1 show. Coke is like party time. Adderall is his maintenance high. Adderall right. is what yep. he would use yep. when he had to read a word wow. off a cue card and sort of sound smart in my experience with him, you know, but all bets are off when it's, you know, hanging out with a bunch of models in the club and all that kind of stuff, which he did for decades. You're not hanging out in studio 54 in the late seventies and early eighties yeah. and not doing cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you get it like uh, a happy meal at McDonald's. Yeah, exactly. Oh, what a great, here's your spoon. you know, when I prepare to talk to you guys now, I'm not, now I'm not going to make a joke about your recovery. I, I had no idea about, I, I think I knew about Jay actually, maybe I know, but yeah. no, I, I probably blocked it out so I could continue with mine. But I think that <laughs> like you're uh, seriously, like your analysis on this stuff and your ability to relate to it, it shows both the sympathy and an honesty that, that you can. Um, let me ask you both though, about uh, the Fox news fella that showed up at the hearings yesterday. His name is Chris Steyerwalt. He was fired by Fox, yeah. right? Um, Jay, you wrote on Twitter, I like how proud Chris Steyerwalt is of his algorithm. And what is it? Piling? Pilling? I said polling. Polling. I, 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 yeah, I misspelled it. I said pilling is what Jason Oh, Miller I've never does done that on Twitter. my reply. You're right. He yeah. seems to be passionate about getting things right at the decision desk. What is exactly why Fox fired him? Truth is a liability when your mission statement is, quote, spoon-feeding lies to the cult. So first, more of your thoughts on his, I guess, integrity and his testimony in terms of what it meant, uh, what it means for the public conversation and frankly, what it meant on election night, uh, re Arizona. I mean, that was such, I felt like an important thing. And also let's not forget to just absolutely shit on Chris Dyerwald for his ending testimony that he winked to the panel. Did they ever, did you see that? It really bothered yeah. me, but okay. <laughs> I, I, uh, well, two things. Uh, I think one, he's sort of, uh, you know, a good representative of whatever the walls were between the news and the opinion department of Fox disappearing over the last, you know, from 2016 on, I think they did take some pride in the fact that they had a top rate news, news organization. It just went through the the lens of all the late night BS from the the people that uh, spun it, uh, and I think you know with uh, with uh, all the people that have left, uh, Chris Wallace is the one I'm thinking of most, but also uh, Shep Shepard. You know, uh, <laughs> is that his name? Shep Shepard. I think it's Shep Shep Smith. That? That's right, yeah. Shep Shepard. Okay, uh, <laughs> all, all got to leave, uh, and I I think that this is probably the the emblematic version of that, you know, that he had a, a system. He talked about the algorithm and he talked about the polling and how it worked. And I thought that was beautiful testimony because it undercuts all of the uh, thought that this could possibly be uh, something that was was being influenced by politics because he nerded out. You could see the nerd in yeah. him, the data nerd, where he goes, oh, well, we had this great thing. We had a we had a polling. And what we did was we would just match the polling to what we were getting with that. And we could tell. And it was so much better than everybody else's. And here's who we worked with. And it was like just like my son talking about Legos, you know, like he just got what he was doing with that. And I'm like, I buy 100 percent that this guy cared about getting it right, regardless of where he worked. And the second he did get it right. And it sort of undid a lot of the narrative that they were trying to spin. It, it shows you what Fox has become even worse than it was that he was immediately ejected out of the uh, out of the building. No yeah. thoughts on uh, on Fox News, former Fox News uh, analyst, election yeah. analyst, Chris Steyerwalt and his performance today. That's a great point. You know, I mean, th- there were people forget this, but there were serious news people at Fox News. I got a buddy who's. He's been there for 25 years. He was at the local affiliate in New York and he went network level. He's an anchor on the weekends. I won't name his name. He's not one of the big nighttime personalities, but he's a news guy. And he calls me up all the time. He's like, Noel, keep going after them. This is insane. And what he told me, he goes, even under Roger Ailes, it wouldn't be as bad as it is now. Right. And we know Fox News has had a huge impact on the culture since they began in 1996. And Murdoch has made a fortune off of it. But for what Jay just described, the policy wonks and the news guys that are really into dealing with facts, it's become a hell on earth. And this guy described to me, he said, 
Tucker Carlson, for example, all of his staffers are like 27 year old racist dudes. Like he's like, it's just all these white guys sitting there all day trolling online, looking at the daily caller and whatever is sort of trending in that demographic that will impact somebody's emotions. Yeah, he has a whole team. He has 19 young people. I think they're Patriot Front whose sole job is to (laughs) comb the news for even unreported instances of a black person beating up a white person so he can make sure that his viewers think that's the that's the issue in epidemic in America. And I made all that up, but it's probably not far off. It's very true. The New Yorker did a profile and that's essentially what they said. They look for race baiting inflammatory issues all day. And this guy described to me, he said, look, it's hell for the normal people that still work there. I mean, it's a big building, right? You know, there's there's cameramen, there's audio techs, there's there's guys that aren't scum of the earth that need a paycheck and have families. And for them, it's almost become a hostile environment. And today's a great example. Like that guy got fired for telling the truth and and good for Fox News for calling it. If they hadn't called Arizona for Biden, it it would have given a head start to the danger that we already saw. You know, I've often said that the the, uh, if you were a parent of like one of those 27 year old kids working at, at Fox News, I would just tell everybody that my son's a porn star. You know, or like he mops floors at a strip club. Like I would like, what is it? How did he get it? He went to yeah. a strip club from J school. Yeah. I don't know how it works, but, <laughs> felt hard for him. but he's definitely well, not working at the most dangerous network in America and right. making that happen. It's a real, it's a real insult to strip clubs. I think clearly that are run by the mafia, well, the even. mopper, the mopper at the end. That's the, that's the problem. Yeah. You, that guy, you got to go in the VIP room. Um, do you think just your quick political analysis, both of you, you know, the, the, the question that you hear the most is, will the fever break? Will anybody in the cult watch these hearings? And if they do watch them, um, will anything come to light? What, what do these hearings mean? I mean, I think the, 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 the best case result is that the Department of Justice, you know, sees them as a criminal referral and, and, and you know, indicts Donald Trump. Best case. And we're not legal analysts, uh, but we're as good as anybody on politics and certainly on behavior. So, Noel, your thoughts on on what, if anything, this changes in terms of the conversation? And does anybody that's in the cult see these A and B, if they do, are they like, wow, he debunked 2000 mules? (laughs) Exactly. I don't think he peels away people from the cult because they're being told not to pay attention. What I do think happens, and and I agree with your point, hopefully DOJ comes out with some charges. That's what needs to be happen, happen. So I think it will be the end of Donald Trump as an ongoing business venture in electoral politics. I do hope and believe that. Most people probably don't want to hear this. I think a, an unfortunate side effect is that it's going to give power to Ron DeSantis. It's going to make the powers that be. New York Post ran an editorial after the first hearing on Thursday, Friday morning, saying it's time to get away from Donald Trump. So I think it'll become a bit of a rebranding of the MAGA movement. And they'll sort of package DeSantis like here's the saner. You know, here's Trump with discipline, you know, so, yeah, yeah, he did do some bad stuff and he ripped some of you guys off. But this next guy is definitely going to use your money for the campaign and not to pay (laughs) his lawyers. Yeah, that's really interesting analysis and a perfect segue to Jay Black, who is constantly defending Ron DeSantis as one of the good ones. And again, really surprising (laughs) you being such a strong progressive, but something about that state or that man that really appeals to you. I just like how he bullies the press. I do. Yeah. I'm a DeSant head. I just, I, you know, the way he, uh, the way he hid COVID numbers and let people die in a state. I mean, that's just a man's man. It's called being an alpha Pete. Look it up. Oh, maybe one day. Uh, so I, I, I'm very hopeful that you're right, Noel, that this is the end of Donald Trump, because I do think, and this might be hopeful thinking on my part, that uh, Donald Trump is a cult of personality that can't be replicated. Uh, there is, you know, ev- MAGA right now is just the turnkey for racists to feel better about themselves, mm-hmm. right? All of these people are saying things that they've wanted to say out loud for years, and now it's finally okay to do that. Well, because I would, you're not being racist. It's you're, it, you're owning the lips. Not, I would are not to feel better about themselves, but to feel <laughs> like the victims. The polling of right. those people yes. is that they are more discriminated against and victimized than black folks. So go ahead, Jay. Right. Sorry, but it's more that they f- want to feel like the victims, not even better right. about themselves. But that makes them, I guess, feel better about themselves. Go ahead. I, so I know. I just I, I I and this again, pure speculation on my part. 
I don't see MAGA dying because I do think Ron DeSantis and, you know, you know to a lesser extent, like the Matt Gates of the world, if he doesn't go to jail from what he did, um, they'll keep it going. But I don't see anybody showing up, you know, to an insurrection party on behalf of Ron DeSantis. You know, I don't know if he has that kind of pull over people. You know, the 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 depth of Donald Trump's narcissism was such a black hole. You couldn't not look. Right. And we're still talking about him. Right. You know, again, there's a hearing going on, but we're going to talk about him forever because of that yes. depth of, of uh, you know, uh, the black hole of his soul. Yeah. But I, one last piece of of hopeful thinking. I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I don't believe that, you know, you you, uh, you know, orchestrate these things. But if you were prepping the country and I'm not talking MAGA, but if you were prepping the middle of the country, sane Republicans and independents for an indictment from the DOJ, these congressional hearings are the best way to do it, because this isn't a press conference from Merrick Garland. This is six days and nights of just evidence being laid out in a methodical manner. And if you arrested him right after that or, right. you know, within a reasonable time frame of that, it's a lot easier to go. Well, if you want to know why, go look at all the stuff we just presented and be done with it. <clears throat> yeah, so that's my thought on that. Well said. Yeah. Anything you'd add to, to any of that? Noel? incredibly well said. And that's what has to happen. I mean, if they are going to indict him, they got to do it right away. You can't give the rest of the summer off and then try to do it in the fall when the midterms, because then they can just cry politics again. And I agree. You're not getting rid of MAGA anytime soon. It's going to take a couple of generations to wash this sort of ignorance and racism. out. It's like, you know, Jerry Garcia died in 1995 and the dead and company just started a new tour last night. You know what <laughs> right. I'm saying? Horrible right. analogy. I'm an old deadhead, but it's like the show is going to go on, you know, without the figurehead, you know, the Trump will become a deity in absentia for these right. guys. But but, the, the, you know, the vehicle is too profitable and too e easy. And, and that's a bigger issue. That's something that us yeah. as comedians can address because yeah. we're all the same people, you know, and it becomes yeah. down to, to you know, to, to, to personality and behavior. Like we're better than this as Americans. And I think that's yeah. the next challenge is to like, is this really what you want? You know, I don't know if we are better than this. I, I know. I'm just trying to be. Helpful. I mean, a certain <laughs> high percentage of us might be, but like you got to take, I sometimes want to take us the whole sum. Um, before uh, I close, I want to ask you both one more question. Uh, Jay and I talked a while ago about, you know, doing something where we talk with men, each other publicly about our struggles, men of a certain age. Uh, and you guys have both been open about your, your uh, sobriety, your recovery here. And I busted, I, I made fun of you for it. And so as a way to redeem myself <laughs> and also as a way to just, you know, kind of fill that mission that Jay and I have talked about, because Noel, you're this kind of guy. Would you mind both telling me a, a quick story about basically maybe how bad it got and how maybe there's someone listening that needs to know it gets better? Noel? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I was working that glamorous life, TV, rock and roll bands. By the time I hit my early 30s, I hit a bottom that was ending me up in the hospitals. I was in the hospital in New York City 12 times before I went to rehab. And rehab for me was NIH, the National Institutes of Health, because they were going to do some experimental protocol, you know, and I was like, oh, that's for me. Give me a magic pill and get me you know back in shape and i went yeah. down there and they said the only magic pill is work in a program of recovery it's surrendering and living one day at a time and learning about your disease and and seeking out a meeting where you can get support and getting honest with yourself and it was the best thing i ever did with my life that was 17 years ago it hasn't been a straight path you know, I, I went out at 10 years. I'm coming up on seven years again. It is what it is, but it's something I do every day. I was on a meeting this morning. I'll be at a meeting tonight. I do service. I don't talk about it specifically because that's one of the traditions, but help is out there and, and never have we needed that more than now. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. we're all under pressure and and trauma. You know, the, the most of us. And like when you can get support and share about your 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 issues. There's no shame in that. It makes you stronger to help people. And you find that other things matter to you more. You know, for me, it used to be about glamour and reliving the good life. Now it's trying to be useful. You know, right. I just want to be a worker among workers and be useful because yeah. we're here for a limited amount of time. Why not do something real with it? Any of your viewers are welcome to DM me anytime if they want some help. Well, I would just that is really thoughtful of you to share. I would say you're failing at being useful, but I don't want to be a dick. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, no, I was going to say, I was going to DM you that, no, but yeah. I, I would have felt bad. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, you are. You, 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 I mean, I'm so yeah. happy that we did this today, and I really appreciate what you just said. I had no idea that it was that bad, and, and while, you know, you don't do the things, you do them for altruism and, and quietly because it probably works, but it's also really great when you can share it. So, to you, Jay. So, one of the things I just... To maybe to tag on that idea of altruism, uh, I I got a lot out of group. We would I would do group every every day when I was in the program. I was in an outpatient program to to figure it all out. And uh, one of the things that you do is you know at first I was such a dick about group because I'm a comedian and I kept going up to people afterward. They tell their stories and go, I could punch that up. You know if you. If you want, because you amble a lot, you got to get to the getting a little quicker. I could just throw you a couple of jokes. Uh, but after a while, you sit there <laughs> and you get to know these people. You do the same thing every day. Every day you're talking to these people. And this, this magic thing happens where you, you start to go, you like you start giving people advice. Like you shouldn't feel this way about yourself. You're not this person. You're an okay person. And I've gotten to know you and, and I, I like you. and. I know you've done terrible things, but those things can be amended and that that's okay. And you realize the whole point of group is you're talking to them like how you should be talking to yourself because you go, oh, these people are me. And I, I'm giving them this love that I was incapable of giving myself in large part because I was on these drugs. Uh, and, and this like sort of flower opens up, you know, where you're just like, oh, I should be kind to myself and others. And, and that's sort of how we get through this. And just to tie it all up with the bow, we're talking about the young men that work for Tucker, uh, you know, this sort of, you know, in cho- uh, inchoate anger that's just out there and that, that has been harnessed, you know, like, you know, you talk about Steve Bannon looking at World of Warcraft players and going, if I could weaponize this, right. I could win an election. Just these, uh, you know, angry uh, young men who have no ability to express themselves or to feel loved by anything other than the other people in this hate group is, you know, when we talk about mental health, you know, yeah. ban the assault weapons. But if you're really going to do something about mental health, talk to these young men and say, you're OK, you're an OK right. kid. We can fix this yeah. so that they don't turn into hate mongers later on. Although, well did said. you see the pictures of these Patriot Front guys? I'm not sure you could say you're OK. Some of them, clearly their parents were directly related. No, no. No, we have to <laughs> we have to get them earlier, Pete. We just uh, get them like in high school. Jay, sorry to step on your really poignant, thoughtful, uh, honest uh, story with my joke. That was uh, speaking of a, a flower opening up, boys. This was amazing. I can't thank you both enough for, for being here and doing this with me. And uh, sometimes, you know, you, you're doing a good thing. And today is one of those times. Thank you very much. Both of you. Hey, thank you, Pete, Pete, thank you for putting this together, because not a lot of people, if I could just be nice to you for a moment, would jump on a suggestion from a listener yeah. in a in a reply tweet and put together a show within you know 48 hours and make it all happen and get everybody together. And I just want to say this is the most fun that I've had all weekend that I because I've been with my family. You know, how yeah, it is, I understand. Um, but it, it's just awesome. I really appreciate you guys having me. And nice work, Pete Dominic. Thank you I both. Agree. All right. Well, there you go. Was I right? Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Open an email, send it to me, and let me know what you thought of that conversation and how I can do that better with those two and with any other two or, or three people really experimenting with the podcast this summer. It's going to grow a lot in many ways. I so appreciate your support sticking with me. So many more folks are listening to it and subscribing with a paid subscription, too, so I can actually make a living doing it right here in the shed. Thank you to Pete Coe. Thank you to John Carroll. Thank you to everybody with a paid subscription. Welcome to new subscribers. Up to see you at the Hangout Thursday night. We do these Zoom Hangouts every Thursday at 8 for over, I think, the last two years. And they always are special. And I like to say, fill your cup back up, which you really need on a Thursday night. And by that, I mean uh, with, with whiskey and beer and a lot of people who don't drink as well. But love being there with us and sharing. So check it out. Subscribe now. Stand up with Pete.com. John Carroll, take us out. Senator Mallory McMorrow of Michigan tomorrow. Stand up. That's right. We got the rise up. You got the spirit.
stand up. You gotta stare the devil straight in the eyes. They got to let him know it's his time to go. See it clear and all you hear is a lie. Go get up off of your butt, get down off of your fence. And even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up. Stand off ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw the land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws and since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was going to come before the change would begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go to make it clear and all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 